Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for those who are joining us live. I see Chico's just getting on all the way from Colombia. Um, and I got it right this time, right, Chico? Colombia. You're on mute. Yeah, you did. Brilliant. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm thrilled to have Rusty Earnshaw with us today. Rusty, thanks for joining us. Uh, just remember, you know, we're going to, Rusty's very cool, very relaxed. And if you have questions at any time, just step in and ask the questions. Please do so. Core value this month is, of course, empathy. Our topic is player centered sessions. Rusty, welcome. Give us your uh, whistle stop journey and, and background. Uh, uh, my uh, father, um, two kids. Husband, most important things. Um, <clears throat> what's my, oh, oh my God. Um, played rugby, went to uni, um, played professional sport, wasn't as good as I could have been, would have definitely benefited from finding a, a coach that was the right coach for me. <clears throat> um, then coached a bit of, um, coached England Sevens, coached club rugby, uh, took two years out to be an economics teacher, which was pretty cool fun, and then went and worked back in the pathway with England, so with the 18s and the 20s, and in coach development, and then for the last two, two and a half years, I've been self-employed, so uh, saying yes to everything, um, stressing about my taxes, <laughs> uh, doing my receipts, like once every few months, which kills me, um, <clears throat> but, but having the time of my life, to be honest. Yeah. Brilliant. And uh, you, you, as a player, I think you won the European Cup, right? And then coached and won the European Cup. Am I right in saying that? I wish I had coached and won it, but I definitely won it yeah. as a player. So my first year, actually, so out of uni, um, I went to Cambridge, uh, studied maths and economics. <clears throat> and then in my first year, I went to the Commonwealth Games in Kuala Lumpur, won the European Cup and definitely thought this was really easy. Um it wasn't. It kind of went downhill from there, really. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I won it, but I didn't go to win it. Yeah. And you, and you went to Cambridge, you said, Rusty. But uh, for the American audience on and the people on and the people who watch this later, why is it that Oxford and Cambridge always qualify for the final of the boat race? Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> and the varsity match. Yeah. Yeah. And then economics. Tell us, how was that? For a couple of years, just take, stepping away from, from coaching and teaching economics, how, how did coaching set you up for that? And then how did teaching economics set you up for where you're at now and, and stuff like that? Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> two things really. One is like, it was probably the, if we're going to talk about empathy, it's probably the thing that had the biggest impact on me, apart from having my own kids, quite frankly. So spending two years teaching, working in a school, being a, being a tutor, hanging out with the kids, you know, at night, just understanding what goes through their heads, what's happening to them, all the pressures, the parents, the school, the academics, the sport, all of that stuff was like massive, really. And then interestingly, about two weeks ago, I was walking down the street in Bristol and I, as a teacher about two and a half hours from here, and a kid ran across the street to me and it was one of the kids I tutored. I can't remember because it was so long ago. And he said, oh, Russell, how are you doing? Da, da, da. And we had a chat for about an hour, which, which hopefully showed that I did a reasonable job. Um, but, but I would recommend it, like all coaches, really, to understand some, better understand learning. You get, I probably watched 40 people teach in the, in the first, in two years. <clears throat> like, if you go and see 40 coaches coach, like, you're going to learn some stuff. So that was really helpful for me. Actually, last thing, most impactful day, spent a day with a kid. So one of the first things you do is spend a day with a kid. And I'll be honest with you, it was really boring. So it made me think, please, like, I don't want the kids to experience this in my lessons. And the strange thing yeah. is the teachers must have known I was coming. So they probably made it even less boring than it would have normally been. So, yeah, it was it was amazing experience. Yeah, I love that. And was that was that something you chose to do? Spend the day with a kid, or was it was it uh, something that you, you had to go through through your your training? Yeah, you had to go through as part of the training. But yeah, I mean, it's um, just trying to see, uh, just trying to see stuff through the eyes of the 
players is clearly like really important. Yeah, no, I think that's huge. And, you know, I went through my uh, PGCE, Postgraduate Certificate in Education and Physical Education back in Worcester, back in 97, I think. Um, and I remember we had Ofsted in for the school and then we had HMI in for the college. So Her Majesty's Inspectors and the school was getting inspected. And I remember uh, teaching a cricket lesson. And this is where I started to think about, I really have to know who's in front of me, right? And uh, I asked the question and I said to the, to the boys, it was year eight boys. And I said, boys, what are the two words we look for when we're bowling in cricket? And nobody put their hand up. So I asked again the question, and then Damien Hart is the boy's name. And this is, we're going back over 20 years. And he was, I think he had an IEP and he said, how's that, sir? How's that? And I said, you know what, Damien, you're on the right line. And then one of the kid goes, ah, line and length, sir, line and length. But that's three words. Um, so, you know, it just made me have to rethink uh, the questions. And again, knowing who's in front of us, right? And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. Most important thing. And, and where's economics fitted in? Well, yeah. I'm a little bit obsessed with behavioral economics and nudge and, and, and that's coaching, quite frankly, like how can you, you know, behavioral change type stuff is clearly what we're, what we're trying to help people understand. Yeah. And I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on behavioral change when we're dealing with adults and uh, people that are in the mindset of, well, we've always done it this way. Yeah. I mean, and look, we've got a, alcoholic mother so my wife's mum's alcoholic and if ever there was a demonstration that people changed themselves it was that mm -hmm. um and, and and the way i kind of put it is we've got to understand where people are which put stop they're at <clears throat> but also like you've, we've got to find ways of them opening the front door rather than us having to sneak in and break in around the back and i've definitely banged my head and I know you've got some stuff, but I'm, I'm thinking about screen time as a classic. You know, it's, it's just like coaching. Um, people I've spent a bit of time with to help me understand this stuff better are people like hostage negotiators. Yeah. So often coach development is hostage negotiation, like they're holding on to this thing that's like really dear to them and they're going to jump. And I'm thinking, ah, there's some other ways we could do this. Yeah, brilliant. Well, on our screen, we have today's objectives. And I know Rusty's got a couple of slides. Um, I've just thrown up a couple of pictures here. Rusty, what, when you see the picture on the left, the, the, the coach-centered and the player-centered, um, what, what jumps out at you? Um, I had a conversation with someone the other day, like, <clears throat> I think we use player-centered quite a lot. Um, and I guess my, my challenge to coaches would be, if we were really player-centered, then as an example in the classroom, well, why wouldn't the kids be running the lesson? Or at least part of it. Or why wouldn't we be supporting them to understand how to run a lesson? And exactly the same on the pitch. Like we've turned up with our session plan. We haven't spoken to anyone. And we think that's going to be player centered. Then we might be a little bit kind of <clears throat> off the mark there. And then I guess the other thing it's making me think of is to what extent do we plan for the action, i.e. the, X's and the O's versus the interaction, i.e. like how, how you find in this. Is there anything you need for me to support you? How could we make this even better? Um, oh, that's really interesting. Why, <clears throat> why is this making you wobble? So it's probably making me think about that stuff. Uh, yeah. The reality is that it's, it's probably a, it's a blend of both, isn't it? And one thing that <clears throat> I think we need to get better at understanding is how how much, what stuff might we need to scaffold and help the players with? Because the right hand side of that diagram is also quite scary for some kids because you've got to think about the rest of their lives. So if they are sat in a classroom that's really teacher centered, if they are, you know, living in a home where actually stuff's done for them and they're told what to do, then, then the right hand side's really scary. And actually, that looks like freedom to me, but it isn't freedom for some people. So the kid I talk about, you know, when I did the session at um, <clears throat> KCS um, Cobham and he said, oh, Rusty, can I give you some feedback? And he said, yeah, that's uh, that's the worst session I've ever done. Um, <clears throat> I was like, oh, sorry, what? Uh, I really appreciate your feedback. And he said, let me explain why. So um, 
My dad's in the military. He's done everything for me. I've never had to make decisions. You've suddenly like given me way too many decisions and it's confusing. I'm over on the right thinking this is like liberating and free. And this kid's going, no, no, no. I, I'm not at that bus stop. Yeah. So <clears throat> I guess both of those words, we, well, we could debate what coach centered and player centered means, but also we probably got to understand that it's really individual as well. Yeah, absolutely. And knowing who's in front of us, right? We talked about it a little bit earlier and knowing their needs and different people needing different steam. Yeah, their hopes, their stages. dreams, their yeah. motivations, their so much stuff. Like <clears throat> we had uh, Ugo on the pod the other day and he was talking about uh, Ellis Genge who plays rugby for England. He said, look, if, if as a coach you know that Ellis Genge wants to inspire kids from Noel West, then you've got some leverage to work with there, haven't you? You know what is the real reason he's playing rugby. Then that is a, that'll lead to a that'll probably lead to better screen time arguments between me and my son. Yeah, brilliant. Well, Rusty, are you able to share your slides? Uh, yep, yep. I'll if if you if you give me a bit of permission, then I, I will. Yeah, let me just stop the share and. I've basically put a few slides together, so we'll go. Uh, I'm going to uh, look and, and I'm not going to make you choose. I, I'll ask you, Chris. So yeah. which, where are you, mate? Which one are you? Which Ooh, one are depends, you depends on the day. Um, today, how are you feeling to, now? Today, right now, I'm six. I'm, right. a, I'm number six. Six actually looks like you. Yeah. Like That's uh, how I feel right now. Yeah. Why is that? I just wide eyed and ready to learn. It looks like the cat's about to break into a smile. Um, our interactions in the past and our relationships, whether it's a WhatsApp or a conversation like this or watching you in action or listening to your podcast uh, just does that for me. You're one of those that uh, fills my bucket, let's say. Nice. So well, I appreciate that. And I'm glad you're not on the tequila like number nine just yeah. yet. <clears throat> I think, I think Tim Bradbury's at seven, Tim. <laughs> oh, there he is. The um, and so I guess the point is like exactly you like we got to check in with people. So, for example, they don't let people fly fast jets in training if they're feeling like a a one, a five, a seven, an eight, or a nine. Like because a there's a high chance they'll kill themselves, and b costs a lot of money, but. So checking in with people. So I've done this over lockdown with businesses and people have gone, I'm one, I'm five. I'm, and we've just gone, should, I, should we just all go and make a cup of tea? And we'll get in some breakout rooms and we'll have, just have some chats. All right, let's just, because you need a bit of a, a break. So checking in with people is, is, is critical. Um, I kind of put this together because this is, I talk about this a lot, but this is where I think I am with coaching and, there's probably the stuff that I think is really relevant to, to today is, is that one, where are people? What bus stop are people at? How do we find a way of them opening the front door rather than we break in round the back? Uh, this is how can people be at their best and what makes them wobble? So I would really need to know that about people. Um, this is the, a township in Kalisha, just outside Cape Town. And this reminds me of the purpose of sport, but we can understand their motivations. Why are they there? This is like, this is the most joyful, like, it's like, it reminds you what sport is about. A um, couple of others, like noticing skills, critical for a coach. Like we should be doing loads of CPDs on noticing, like you can't make decisions without seeing some stuff. Um, I think our job is problem setters, but we've got to understand, like, is this problem, like, too hard for them? Is it too easy? Have we scaffolded them? Like, understanding that is something that I'm, I'm trying to become better at. Uh, and then probably this last one, really, the 1.3% the is Johnny Wilkinson said, oh, Rusty, I'm starting to understand the, the psychological aspect of the game. I think I'm about 1.3% of the way there. And I'm less than that. So I'm like, I've got about 99 point something percent less to go. But we cannot ever forget that even if we're talking about something that's technical, like it might be the confidence is a part of this. 
or it might be that in a game situation, the ability to self-regulate. So we can never forget the psych part of, of, of what we do. And I've just done a piece with uh, Ulster Rugby today and I quizzed some of their players. So international players, players that didn't, that have now left their academy. And I asked them about their experiences in that kind of transition from school to academy. And they spoke about this so much like lack of clarity, lack of communication or when it was done well, you know, when one environment was really different to another and I didn't understand why, when I didn't have a clue what the journey potentially looked like, when I was being compared to other people, all of this stuff that, that I guess is in people's heads um, that I guess we've got to try and work out as, as much of it as possible so we can truly go look where is this person at this moment in time knowing that it might be different tomorrow um so that's some stuff that's probably relevant <clears throat> i put this down because i think it's helpful to just kind of go look this is the way i see coaching i see it as like we designed some practices i'm up in the top right a lot at the moment and obviously you had amy on um, I'm given a grief about calling it gamification versus video game design. We we then we so we control these two things on the left, practice design and our behaviours. Okay, what I think then is we connect up with other coaches and we co-coach and, but then this is the magic. So for me, this is the stuff we'll probably reference today. This is the, how do we find out where people are? How do we support them as individuals? How are we empathetic to their needs? So. <clears throat> we kind of put this together as a kind of some of the, I guess, coaching skills we would use. And all of this is, would then also you'd be going, so at this moment in time, why am I going to do this? Okay. Why am I not going to do this? So when I choose to intervene now and let's say, actually, I'm going to give someone a replay. So Chris has had a go at something. He's done it really well. <clears throat> I've chosen to, to say, Chris, do you fancy a replay? And we'll put another defender in and see if he can do it. So why have I chosen to do that? And what did I choose not to do? So maybe my second choice was just to let it go. But I chose the first one because actually Chris has had a reasonable amount of success and I want to give him some stretch. So <clears throat> for me, this is the magic, this stuff here. And look, there's been all the stuff that people are doing. It might be that I chose, actually, my, my, my third choice was, Actually, <clears throat> I'm going to get someone else to give the feedback to Chris. Because um, actually, that might be really powerful. And that might be, a, you know, the stuff we know about teenage brain would suggest that <clears throat> they often care more about what their peers think than a 45-year-old man from Middlesbrough. So, so look, this is, this is probably my, this is how stuff makes sense in my head. Practice design, coach behaviours. Be intentional around co-coaching, but then this is the magic. And the reason I kind of put these two first is, you don't know these, then I think this is, you're like putting your finger up to the wind, quite frankly. So if you've got a practice that's not engaging, not challenging, not setting problems, or one that's too hard, then you'll be firefighting and you won't be able to do this. If you're not aware of yourself and you and who you speak to and who you don't, so the kid from from KCS who said, like, Rusty, that's the worst session ever. That's classic Rusty. So when I'm, when I'm silent and probably noticing, I may well be missing the people that are finding it the hardest. So I need to work on that. Or if I'm co-coaching with you, Chris, I'll go, Chris, could you just keep an eye on, on you know, and support those people? Because I know that I'm not that good at it. So <clears throat> you look like you're about to ask me a question, Chris. No, I was just there. Uh, I was just thinking, um, I'm, I'm, I can see the the Northumbria, the colours. It looked like you got the paint palette in there, but I, I can see the the words underneath. And just just looking at that and just hearing you talk, like knowing where you're, you have to know yourself, but you also have to know who's in front of you. But probably know yourself know yourself better to 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 figure out what you're doing with your co-coach, right? What the roles are, so there's clarity in those roles to avoid any confusion, and then the players know what we're looking for. And I'm just looking at this and looking at your last slide and I'm thinking about IDPs, right? And we go and we do these evaluations with kids and we do these things, 
um, but you're using pictures, right? Pictures everywhere, which is what we're asking. Yeah. A lot of people are asking kids to do as opposed to words and documents and stuff like that. And I just think it's, it's interesting because the old saying of one picture paints a thousand words, right? Yeah, so there's an IDP here and I'm going to talk about that in a second. So that's, um, this is Marcus Smith's IDP and I'll, I'll definitely reference that. And I wanted to show this picture because this picture is an awesome picture for me because it's the first time I, ne I met Nick Wilkinson, who's the guy over on the right. And, yeah. uh, and we're really good friends now. But I, I remember him like, um, I was like, is, is, is there a reason you're the one doing all the talking? And I remember him being like really quiet for a period of time. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I'm curious, like this is a, a Saracen's DPP session under 13. Like what are, what are people noticing or what's, what's kind of flying out to them or what questions and feel free just to mute and talk about what you're seeing or thinking as a coach. Cause look, we, we see this stuff all the time. We'll, you know, this is noticing. Okay. Seeing this. What, what are you thinking? Go, go ahead, guys. I'm mute. Um, I'm thinking, why is the assistant coach running with the ball? <laughs> right. And I know Wilco as well. I've not spoke to Wilco for a while, but just looking at that, you're going, why is the assistant coach <laughs> running with the ball? And then why are the little ones trying to catch up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the assistant coach. Man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, what, what, what are other people thinking? Be brave. Come on, friends. I'm mute. Chico, all the way from Colombia. I know Tim's got something to say as well. Hey, Tim. Tim will have something. I was just finishing my breakfast while I was trying to... <laughs> so I was thinking, why am I choking? <laughs> Is that all you got from that picture, Tim? Well, no, there's so many, much, isn't there? It's peak height velocity. Could it be kids of the same age? It's mixing kids of different ages to challenge. It's oh, so just to give you clarity. Free play. So, so, yeah, so this is same age group. So, yeah, this this fella here is, he's under 13. He'd be the biggest under 13-year-old I've ever seen. So... Um, <clears throat> old GMOs. Yeah. This, this kid is, interestingly, though, so... You know, and, and as you said, it's about matching. This kid's older than this kid. So doesn't, you know, he just happens to have gone through some maturation stuff a little bit. Anything else people are thinking about? I'm just curious. Depends whether the person kneeling down is actually a coach. Because is uh, this the emotional intelligence piece or is it just a parent in tears or praying? Over, over here? Yeah. So actually, interestingly, so the, this is this kid's family. This is his first ever rugby session. So once again, you've got to know the person in front of you. So you might look at this picture and go, well, look at it. This kid's cruising. It's, hard, it's, it's really hard for everyone else. This kid has played rugby for eight years. So this kid's the kid that's played the longest. However, this kid's, his whole family are to the left of this screen. Come to watch him for his first ever rugby session. Like, whew, I'm nervous thinking about it. <laughs> Anything else people are thinking? Or oh, Tim, any other questions you would have? I would have to, I'd have to question Wilco's positioning, maybe, depending on, you know, what, what was the topic? Where, where's the, you know, where's the space? There's no cones. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look, and of course, like, so, like, where and maybe Wilco was tired, you know, but where Wilco stands is going to influence what he sees. So we've got this amazing opportunity now to look at this picture and it's static and we can go, okay, what about this? But the reality is the, the coaching environment's way more dynamic than that. So, <clears throat> yeah, and I'm thinking about, well, is he looking, is he, how much time was he looking off the ball? Because actually most of the players are off the ball and, you know, what, what do they understand about off the ball as, versus on the ball? At this moment in time, so this is a football, actually. This kid has actually just kicked the ball and, and, and gathered it, which is like, so this kid had come from football and I was trying to get him traction and having to do something cool. And I said, man, I bet you can't type stuff. And he did. So he was pretty pumped at this moment in time as well. Uh, but this is like, this is the kid that's having the biggest stretch today. This is his first rugby session. Everyone else, this is 
relatively easy for compared to this kid. So anyway, I just wanted to show this just to go, look, we'll see thousands, millions of these things, you know, we'll go into different environments. All of this stuff, the questions Tim asked, the questions, Chris, you mentioned, they're like stuff we'd be thinking, wouldn't it be helpful to find that out? Like, how does this kid over here, I mean, how does he like feedback? Like, what's this kid's hopes and dreams? Like, which part of the session did this kid enjoy the most? Mum, dad, brothers, what type of stuff did you notice? Like, oh, could you could you give some feedback to this kid on the stuff he did well? Because actually, you know, you're a you're a senior member of this group, and this kid would really benefit from it all. This is the type of stuff. So, this is probably the slide that I went for, Chris. That I thought I'll put some stuff on a slide, and um, I'm definitely like, if anyone goes, ah, oh, Rusty, tell me about that picture. Which one? Which one is uh, is is speaking to people at the moment. I'm loving the Spider-Man mug, by the way. Trying to find the Spider-Man mug. Spider-Man mug's uh, in Colombia, isn't it? Oh, yeah, there he goes. That's Chico. I couldn't Chico, see because his name's over there. Um, which, which, which picture's kind of speaking to you at the moment? Friends, this is interactive. The, chair, uh, the one, the, the one that's, uh, you know, the lit, you know, there are some cards on the table. Oh, cards on the table, yes. Yeah, so, that one. What is it about? Yeah, so this is, is that um, a game or? <laughs> yeah, they're playing. We're teaching kids to play poker from a young age. Um, no, this is at Worcestershire Cricket. So this is in the academy, and this is for us to truly understand the kids. So these kids here are leading this table. <clears throat> this is a mum. I think that's a dad. And there's some mums and dads and coaches watching as well. And the kids are designing the session. So they are going, this is the stuff that's meaningful to us. And the parents are doing their best not to, oh, well done, top man, Chris. And the parents are doing their best not to intervene. However, what was really interesting to watch here was like the kids were really in creativity, you know, <clears throat> lots of different types of shots, lots of interesting games giving us ourselves options. The, the parents, the mums especially, were trying to pick the cards that were based around resilience because they would go, look, we, we understand that actually it's the resilience stuff. So <clears throat> I'm not saying one's right or wrong, but it's interesting, isn't it, that here's some, some viewpoints. But, uh, but I guess unless we go through this exercise, we don't understand what the kids are. Uh, we actually did a, prior to this, we did a thing where the parents observed the session and they wrote down, so we gave them some prompts. Um, your, your kid's best interaction with a coach. When you saw your kid at their best, when you saw your kid wobbling and they would give them some intention to watch the session and then the kids replayed it back to their parents. And one of the kids, uh, this wasn't, it wasn't this group, it was a slightly older group. He said, um, so he's a 17 year old lad, so just outside of becoming a, professional cricketer he said um my favorite bit was when the coach asked me what my favorite meal was i mean none of the parents guessed that one safe to say and i said oh that's really interesting like wh why do you think he said because because he just showed me that he cared about me like interesting like and then i've, I've just done a piece this piece for Ulster. i just spoke to one of the the player who's left the academy and he he's coached now by a guy i know called aiden mcnulty and I said, oh, to give me some feedback on Aiden. He said, I've never met a coach who cares about me as much as Aiden does. It's like, and it's the most important thing. <clears throat> so really this is like, if we're gonna be truly player centered and understand and what's going on with them, then let's, let's create some exercises like this. And it might be that during lockdown, you've, you know, you've got the kids to design their perfect session to design their perfect match day, to um, to design their perfect coach is always a good one. And then cross your fingers that it's you. But it might, you know, it's we can then just explore gaps. Okay, well, we, we chose resilience. Why did you choose this? So I just think this this is a real good example of how we can we can get some information that would be helpful for us as coaches. Um, Tim, what are you which picture is speaking to you, Timothy? Let me just build on what you said about involving the parents. I had a conversation with an ECNL coach this morning 
who said he was being forced to go outside tonight when it's going to be below freezing where we are because of parent demands. I said, have you talked to them about like the kids being first and whether the kids will enjoy it and physical load because you have a game Saturday? And of course, the answer is there's been no conversation with parents at all. Yeah. I mean, parents are the most significant person. They are at this age. I mean, those kids aren't there without the parents, like unless they're illegally driving cars. Um, they are like, and, 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 and what was important for us as well was like, to be honest in rugby, lots of the players in the England pathway, their, their dads are really famous. <clears throat> so their dads were often players like, you know, Mike Marga, Paul Grayson. We had loads of those situations. So we've got to be absolutely like well connected with the parents. It's critical. Absolutely. Um, which Tim, pick a picture, pick a picture. Well, you've got, I've got to go with the pink chair. We won't just make it a chair. We'll make it a pink chair. Yeah, look, that's, I really like this as a thought experiment. So if you've got a coaching group, so let's say it's me and me and Chris, like what's our empty chair? And who's missing out because of that? So, and what are we doing about it? So often we'll have coaching teams and I'll give you a good example for me. So I, I, I work with a lot of players and the reality is I haven't played international 15s played sevens a really, really long time ago. But so there is no benefit tax. If you look at this bottom picture here, this is Johnny Wilkinson with some of our best young fly halves. So Marcus Smith there, uh, Cammy Redpath. Um, now, Johnny is filling my empty chair. He is able to explain to them and talk through some of the stuff that he experienced playing international rugby. It might be that in our coaching team, we are missing someone who's able to stretch the best kids. Well, then either we've got to do something about it or we've got to, you know, we're going to upskill ourselves or we bring someone in, we bring guest coaches in or whatever it might be. But if we are truly going to meet people where they are and understand them as individuals, then we might not be the answer to everything. And that's, I guess that's sometimes a big leap for coaches. The other reality for me is I'm a 45 year old journeyman rugby player. Like I'm coaching lads who are going to go and play for England. Then if they're as good as me, then England are going to be even worse than they were last weekend, quite frankly. So um, you've just got to, that's a, that was probably quite a big leap for me as a coach as well. You know, actually, I've got to get out of the way of some of these people and actually put some other people in contact with them who are better than me at doing this. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I'm always kind of considering. Um, Chris, pick one. Chris, what, which one are I'm you? Gonna, I'm going to go with the green post-it note. Oh, mate. So this was uh, this was cricket again. So I guess it's just thinking about your interactions. Like, what could they look like? Um, and I'll give you a good example of how I wouldn't think now, but I would have previously. So I was at an England training session, and one of the players made a mistake. And a player from, from um, uh, Nathan Earl plays on the wing, he, he had a go at this player, he made a mistake, and he went, oh, for fuck's sake, da, 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 in front of everyone. So this player, it's one of his first ever sessions for England. So I, I chatted to Nathan afterwards, and I said, oh, mate, you know when you, you, know when you had a go at, uh, sorry, I didn't say that, I said, you know when you had that interaction with Mitch, like, earlier in the session, like, what was your second choice? He was like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, when you had a go at him in one of his first ever England sessions, in front of everyone, like, what did you choose not to do? He said, well, well, a Quinn's Rusty, when we make mistakes, we just shout at each other. And that is like probably the first 10 years of my coaching is I'm just doing the stuff I've always done. So now I would think, like, how intentional can we be with interactions? So this lad here, this is a cricket session. The coach said to him before the session, how can I support you today? And uh, he said, I really want to practice this new ball and da-da-da. So we... we so we said, look, which part of your finger would leave the ball last? And so we put, a, we put a cross on his finger where it would leave. And his goal was if he rubbed that off in the session without, like, cheating, uh, then all the coaches would do 100 press-ups at the end. So gave him a real good focus. I think that's a really cool interaction. He's got a massive incentive. 
because the coaches are going to do press ups. It also kind of breaks down the hierarchy between coach and player when the players are counting out press ups for coaches. I do like it. So I guess my point there is that all the interactions are different. So this is a this is um, a Foxy. So Foxy's wearing a target top. So our best player, one of our better players, skillful players, Foxy. People get shot on you today, Foxy. It's double points for them. So we are individualizing. And then, of course, we can go, Foxy, who would, like, could you nominate someone else that would benefit from wearing this top? So once again, we might have a game going on, but actually there's an individual interaction going on here. Where Foxy is, is he's really skillful. And he, and so he needs a bit of stretch. Where this lad is, is he wants to practice something new. So he's got a really playful way of being rewarded for practicing it. And the coaches aren't going to get in the way of him. Um, this probably is a good example of an off field. So this is Marcus Street. And for me, there's so much good going on here. Like it's, it's how he would want a meeting to be. He is 17. He just happens to have a really good beard, even though he's born in August. They're not face to face. There's not a coach here with a, with a book, like writing down all the notes and potentially feeling like they're being judged. So this is just a really casual interaction. Is this a performance conversation? Of course it is. But this is meant to make Marcus feel at ease, to be himself, to have that conversation. And so I just think like us being really intentional around these, and I guess that's the, I guess that's the beauty of watching 40 teachers. If you watch 40 coaches or listen enough to, to people during lockdown, you'll pick up some some more tools for your coaching toolbox, quite frankly. And then you'll be able to go, okay, don't need the hammer today. I think I'll get the screwdriver out. And imagine that as an analogy, not an actual thing. Chico, did you, uh, have you got your hand up? Yeah. <coughs> uh, you just high five. I wanted to ask you about the yeah. picture on the bottom, the one that's like an FBI <laughs> uh, crime scene or, or something, <laughs> you know, where they put all the lines on all the pictures. I, I was wondering, like, okay, what, what's that? Yeah, so, um, so, so Chico, yeah, that is an FBI crime scene at uh, Ulster Rugby. Um, now, this is, uh, mate, and, and, and this is class. So we would use whiteboards a lot. We talk about the players putting, like, their challenges on there. And it's the same again, meet people where they are, like, Here's the session plan 24 hours before you kind of set some challenges. Now, it might be that me and Tim are going to compete against each other. Or it might be that me and Tim are going to compete uh, against you and Chris. And we're going to, or it might be that me, Chris, you and Tim, we're going to add up our scores. And if we get a certain amount, we, we, you know, coaches do 100 press ups. However, this is the next level. So, Uh, Ulster, this is their language. So they talk about how can how they talk about squeezing every drop. So on the whiteboard it says, how can we help you squeeze every drop? And so they then put coaches' pictures on the board. The player had a picture, and they put the picture next to the coach or coaches that they wanted to engage with in the session and the stuff they wanted to focus on. Oh my days! Why have I never thought of that? So. If you can, you might not be able to see all of it, but the, the words were the reflection of the coaches. So this was three weeks in. So more players thinking, players developing themselves, coaches having better conversations, players approaching coaches, a great checkpoint for coaches, transfer TBC because they haven't played a game yet. So this is the people just below the first team. Like who would want more players thinking? Yes, please. Players developing themselves. Yes, please. Coaches having great conversations. Yes, please. The players coming to the coaches rather than the coaches coming. Yes, please. Like, so what a what a really simple way to actually, you know, and could be quite playful with the pictures. So the kids could just bring their thing every week and and just put it on the whiteboard and go, right, actually, today I want to I'm gonna check in with Chico, I'm gonna check in with Tim, and these are my areas of focus. Genius. Um So look, I think what I'm saying is there's probably some coaching aids that will make this easier for you. The stuff that, because I go and do like one-off sessions, like often, you know, you, 
this I, I would take a whiteboard and use it to either share information or for them to give me information. Um, something like this over you know a period of time would be would be a great use of a whiteboard. Quite frankly, I'm getting a nod of approval. Chico is like patented it. He's like he's if you get the first patent in Colombia, Chico, I'm ten percent. All right, ten percent. <laughs> okay. Um, so look, and, and, and I'm sure there's other ways you could do this and think about this, but I, I just really like it. What's your thoughts, Chris, when you see it? Uh, I love it. I love it. And I just, you know, I, I look at that and I think, you know, our coach is ready to release control or will ego continually get in the way, right? Um, because I think as coaches, a lot of us at times, we want to show the kids what we know as opposed to like you said, meeting them at their bus stop and every kid's getting on and off uh, at different stops and stations. Uh, but just meeting them more, you know, I'm just looking at that and going so, so simple yet. So brilliant. You know, oh, we genius. go there with us. And, and, <clears throat> Carry on. Yeah, no, and the, sorry, I was just going to say the stuff that for me makes this easier is if you've got some, so I've got some small sided games. I would play a lot. I've got some other games I would play a lot. So, you know, we're going to play the All Blacks game. What level do you want to start on? Or do you want to play the All Blacks or the Saracens game? I'm not like, I haven't got thousands of games that I'm trying to think of something new every time. What I have got is a list of really helpful skill games that I know are well designed. And of course I can play around with size of area. I can play around with numbers and unloads and overloads. But then this is the magic. So this is the individual stuff. Now, of course, your gift as a coach is to be able to go, hang on a second, Chico. I think you could do more than that. Like, I think, you know, so give me a shout when you've achieved it and then we, we can talk about what comes next. What's the next stretch? But <clears throat> at least I kind of know where you are. And I think a whiteboard gives permission. I've done... We did uh, some coach development days with teachers and um, and this is a grown up. So this was Luke Pendlebury and we were doing a session and, and we just said, look, whiteboard over here, just put on like how you're experiencing the game. And he put, um, this is too hard for me. Like I'm pretty confused. And like, I might not have seen that or a coach might not have seen that, but I think a whiteboard will often give you permission to have, have, some conversations that you might not have the language to have. So, or, or the ability for, a, you know, a young person to go to a coach and go, Rusty, this is terrible, seriously. So I think it's a good way to give permission. Yeah, brilliant. What, what, because, <clears throat> just because we can't see the, the pictures again, it was more players thinking, players. Uh, oh, on there, so they've yeah. got, yeah. So more players thinking, players um, developing themselves, Coaches having <laughs> conversations and then the others, more players approaching coaches, which is the one for me. So I think, wouldn't that be a great outcome for a coach if you said, in today's session, I want everyone to come to me and ask me a question? Yeah. Like versus either I'm going to tell them stuff or I'm going to ask them questions. So, and then, yeah, look, the, and just, I, I thought this, the last couple of pictures, I thought this was, and I've probably shown this before, but I just thought this was a really nice piece of work from Millfield. Like, here's a player, Cam. Here's a player. You know, he's spending 67% standing still. This this is great feedback for coaches. You know, as and when they want it, as and when the front door's open, probably don't want to break in round the back with the news that the kids are bored of your sessions. But how good is we as coaches and, you know, of noticing who's had the ball, who hasn't had the ball, What's this person's experience? Have I spoken to them? A good example is like, so, well, so hockey goalkeepers just have a different experience. They put their kit on, on their own. They take a bit of time, so they miss out on the social. They're at the end where the ball goes in. They're never at the end where the goal's scored. Um, people tell them they let the ball in. They didn't let it in. But how aware are we? So I watched... Um, couple of coaches uh, international coaches and they didn't have a goalkeeping coach and then the end of the session I was like oh do you know how many times each of you spoke to the goalie 
was it intentional that you spoke zero times? I, I see it in football. So I remember last time I was at Birmingham, goalies did a session and then came over. None of the outfield coaches engaged. Oh, what have you guys been doing? Can we add it into this game? Like, we missed an opportunity to meet people where they are. What have you been working on? What's your call? Cool, let's, okay, well, how about if we put a bib there in the goal and, and that's worth double points? Is that cool? Would that be helpful? Yeah, 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 awesome. So, yeah, just thinking about, like, almost like, could you put some values and some numbers on some stuff that, that might help you as a coach better understand some of these experiences as well? Yeah, I'm, you got me thinking, right? And I'm curious now, Rusty. Obviously, um, for those people that don't know, Rusty came up with Fletch with the coach challenge cards, um, the game within the game, which is brilliant. And I'll put information out after that. But you've got me thinking now, if we could create like a, a bingo, for example, um, for each kid, a bingo for each kid, whether it was a coach interaction, asking the coach question, did the coach speak to me? And having like check marks of, you know, was it positive interaction? Was it a corrective interaction? Um, you know what I mean? Did we give that child an opportunity to help somebody else or explain the decision that they made, why they made it, what did they notice within that decision? So it was like just like an in intentional interaction bingo, right? And, like and, and then how you, how you fill those out. What does that look like? Um, do you know what I mean? And you've yeah, got me thinking. Of... And then the other, the other thing that that, come, that muddies the waters here is co-coaching. So if let's say me and you were coaching, and you know you had five interactions with Tim and I had six, but we had none with Chico. Like if we haven't spoken, and Tim's the best player, and we and Chico's not that good. So actually, I'm not that fussed about speaking to Chico, which would be really typical. Like we'll speak to the best players more than you know, all the centre mids or the people that are in rugby that are nine and 10 and will miss some people on the edges perhaps. Then, oh, by the way, did me and you agree what we were going to speak to Tim about? Or has Tim just got like loads of really confusing stuff that actually isn't that helpful? Yeah. Um, and I guess that's, uh, so this is a development plan. So this is Marcus's development plan. Now that gives everyone clarity, like gives us some language. So his stuff around mindset, around pulling his socks up. Well, I know what that means. He knows what that means. Fletch knows what that means. Peter Walton knows what that means. And it might be different language for someone else. Well, well it definitely is different language for someone else. And what's the stuff that he's like really good at and what's the stuff he's working on? Um, and what's his goals? What's he, what's he trying to achieve through this stuff? And this is, this is Josh Bayless. This is a bit of a wider one. This is like involving S and C. This is case formulation involving s &C, involving psych, involving school. So actually, like, do we know what's going on, like, away from here? Like, Josh is doing three A-levels. And actually, when we put together his Bath schedule, his England schedule, his Millfield schedule, his academic, then it just looks like a car crash. So being, especially around this kind of age where people are transitioning across to perhaps a first team or something, this is really important, in my opinion. This is really important for every, you know, at every age, really. And the way I would, some, you know, where I would often simplify it, let's say I'm off to coach a session and I'm, I'm generally looking at the kids going like, what's their plus, what's their minus? So what's just my head? What's their, what's going to stretch them? What's going to be the stuff that'll make it easier if I need to? And then what's their, trying to find out like, what's their wants, what's their needs? So What's the thing I've noticed them getting really kind of excited and into, and that looks like it's something they want to do, but also like there might be something that we're missing here. So the person I would speak about here is James Rodwell, England sevens. And what would he want? Loads of information well in advance. What did he need? The exact opposite. Because rugby sevens doesn't look like that. So I might have to give him a bit of this to get to a bit of this, you know? So I'm always trying to think of, yeah, just people as individuals in a session. And I guess both these things, so the players presenting their development plans to you as a coach and you presenting your development plans to them just creates real good conversations, loads of useful information. And of course, we still have the ability to go, hang on a second, you've missed this. This is going to be a different, you know, this is 
this is mission critical for you, Marcus. If you don't achieve this, you're not going to get a contract. So, of course, that's like, it's a, it's a co-created this, really. Yeah, and I think that's the huge thing there, right? Just co-creating and, and just seeing where it's at as opposed to coach, 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 coach. This is what you need, need, need. As a, you know yeah, I mean? and there'd be some questions that, and you would all have some questions that you would use loads. And the ones for me are things like, like tell, me, tell me one thing that'll help me coach you better. Or, you know, what is it that makes you wobble? And how can I help you? Um, when are you at your best? So I've been doing a bit of work with some coaches and just, you know, tell me, when were you coaching at your best? Like, and why? What was the stuff that was helpful? And, and what's happening now that's, that's not helpful? And then we can find out where people are, quite frankly. In the same way we coach development, my preference now is to go, look, bring a, bring a session plan. So I just did a bit of work with uh, Cardiff Football Club and, and I said, look, bring me three session plans, three different age groups, and we will just chew the fat. So we looked at it from a, look, this point of view, okay, where's this? Where's the planning for interaction? What type of, what type of skills are you likely to use a lot as a coach? And let's talk about some individuals. But I met them where they were. Rather, and of course, like, well, that makes perfect sense to me, but I haven't done that all my life. So um, I guess, yeah, just thinking of, you know, what are the questions that you have that you've found helpful to understand where people are? Because it's all like in their head. Um, what question have you got now? Which uh, I think I asked you, Chris, like which picture is speaking to you? Like, I, I, I know I was really interested in, you know, because everyone was looking at this slides to this page and people would have been looking at different things. Well, Unless I ask you, I never find out what's in your head. Um, and I guess that's maybe we should just uh, rephrase questions as just finding out what's in other people's heads. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Questions for Rusty, if you do unmute, I want to be sensitive to his time as well. Mate, I'm chilled. I can chat for as long as you want, really, to be honest. What's, uh, Stephen, what are you thinking about? What's the stuff that's kind of resonated with you? Trying to figure out how to wobble. <laughs> I mean, Steve, I've so, seen Steve walk. He wobbles when he walks. So he's. Uh, what would make you wobble as a coach? So what would make you like get a little bit agitated, Stephen? I don't want to make an assumption of my wobbling but I want to understand what you mean by wobble. I mean, I think I understand yeah, in context. Yeah, in context, I understand, but I wanted yeah, to make so, sure. So the question actually came from England Women's Cricket, and I really liked it. So they would use it with their girls to go, look, how can we stress you, really? But it's probably a nicer way of saying it, like, what makes you, what makes you stressed? What's, um, like, yeah, what makes you wobble? And... I think it's then a conversation. And so if I give you an example, so doing a bit of stuff with England handball and there was a lad that was like, just losing his, with the referee. And I was like, oh mate, I'm really interested. Like, like, I'm, I'm, are you aware of like what makes you wobble? And he was like, oh yeah, the referee. And I was like, cool. So have you got any kind of tactics for it? No. Okay. Well, look, and, and I would generally at this point go, look, some people who are way cleverer than me have told me that Apparently, if you smile, it releases all the best stuff in your body. So why don't we do a deal? So if you want to, like, every time the referee annoys you, you look over, smile at me, and I'll keep a record of how many smiles, and I'll see if you missed any smiles. Um, and and, and it, was, it was great fun. I think you got to, like, eight smiles. Um, so it's that, really. It's then to just get into a conversation and probably for them to be aware and them to be a little bit like, okay, I'm going to check in with myself on this and be a bit metacognitive about it. And then at that point, I might go, look, if, if it's not smiles, like, is there any other stuff that's helpful for you? So for Marcus, it was pull my socks up, remind me to get back in the moment. For other players, it was, it was different stuff. So I just think it's a conversation and it's a conversation I would have a lot with coaches and, and, and the general answers are match day. Match day feels very different to training. Um, poor refereeing decisions. 
that type of stuff. Um, so now I've explained it, Stephen, what makes you wobble? Uh, actually, I'm actually thinking more about uh, mutual friend, Chris, you know, Danny Gaspar. Yeah. Because I was so high strung as a kid that he used to find different modes to bring me into the moment as a goalkeeper <laughs> with your mind wandering throughout the game matches. You know, yeah. finding that one thing, I can think of players that, having conversations and needing to find that one thing to bring them in the moment. Yeah, nice. And was that when he was a player with you? No, it was when he was a coach. Okay. So, so for example, another example of a player is a player that's... And his would have been players around him helping him, which I, I don't think is necessarily that helpful in the long run, but he found that really helpful. And actually, he's now, like, he's pretty much in the moment all the time now. But both him and Marcus would have, something goes wrong, you'd probably be thinking, like 10 minutes, lads, any chance of getting back in the moment? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so that's, that's, I guess that's why I asked that question. Well, with younger kids, then how are you, how do you collaborate with, say, younger kids to help them find what makes them wobble? I mean, because it's not always the obvious, of course. I mean, there's so many external factors, whether it be parents or whatever else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you have a collaborative conversation to make? Ask, you ask them individually. Give them the yeah, you might ask them individually. You might. Um, so if I give you, uh, you might want to try create it. So I, I, I think a good way to do it might be look, and, and you'll probably notice it. It'll be like poor refereeing. So whenever I go and coach football in an academy, they just all have a go at me. So um, I'm like, he's doing my head in. So I'll give you the example of Birmingham City. So. We played a game and one team got to a superpower. This was the under-14s. And I said to them, like, what, what do you want? And, and, and I gave them some options. And they said, Rusty, we want you to... Um, we want you to referee them badly. And I said, OK, cool, on one condition. In, um, in 10 minutes when this game's over, you're going to give them individual feedback on their behaviours. So you pick a partner each. And at the end of 10 minutes, you're going to give them feedback. So one way might not be for me to make them aware of it, I guess. One thing might be to create a game where half are aware and half are just doing what they've always done. And then we can do that. Now, that's with like 13-year-olds. You might, at a younger age, you might, I would be quite playful with it. It might be that, look, I'm going to referee the game badly. And so you might signpost it, you might not. Um, and it's going to be me against you. Every time someone loses their crap with me, like it's going to be a goal for the referee type stuff. So it might be playful ways of, and it'd be pretty common stuff, to be honest. Um, but as you know, it'll be, for me, it'll be, it'll generally be quite individual, but I might want to go, look, we're going to, we're going to tick some stuff off here. We're actually going to talk about poor refereeing or the parents being idiots on the sideline or, or stuff like that. About 10 years ago, we used to take the whiteboard out and uh, we used to have a, an unhappy face, a face with a no smile and a smiley face. And this is what we do with younger kids. And we just ask them to, to point to which face that they were at. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, we can't share pens anymore or get them to go mark, tally marks. And I would ask them, OK, why was your face like that? What, why did you go for that face? And this is kids of six, seven and eight. And of course, you've got the one word answers and then you've got the kids who are going to write the thesis on well, what had happened was, do you know what I mean? So just different ways of checking in. Yeah, and you, can, you could just go, look, I'm, I'm stood here. Stephen stood 10 yards away from me. Stand on the line, like, where are you in terms of wobbling at the moment? Like, okay, cool. Um, um, has anyone got any clues? So when I did the session at Birmingham, I, at the end of it, 20 of them, I said, put your hand up if you've got a solution to this problem currently. And three kids put their hand up out of 20 in a football academy. And um, and I said, oh, would you mind telling everyone what it is? And they just spoke about some stuff that was helpful for them. It was three completely different answers. It was, but I guess it was almost like the, let's make people aware of it to start with. And I think how do you use your peers? So Tim, if you're that session in Boston, I had co-coaching cards. So, but one of the kids chose one. And he said, oh, I'm going to be like, and his job was to catch people doing stuff well and then to stretch them. So, and at the end of like the 20 minute section, I said, oh, who's, 
tell me about your best coaching interactions. And they were all with this pesky little eight-year-old kid, not me, God damn it. Like, hang on a second, I'm the coach. Um, so it might be that a good way to do it is to use some players who understand it and actually go, look, I want you to help, you know, Stephen and Chris today actually come up with a solution to this because, you know, you've got a solution. So that conversation is often way more powerful, as I said, than the 45-year-old man from Middlesbrough. Now, yeah, you've probably got to take a bit of planning and thinking about it and Sometimes it'll go wrong and sometimes it won't. At the very least, you make people aware of it and perhaps start to talk about some solutions for us. Um, and then the other thing, and tag into what Tim said earlier, I would definitely involve the parents in this because they're, I mean, often when that kid shouted at the ref, I'm thinking, yeah, I can tell which dad it is. Brilliant. Questions for Rusty. It's the most, but isn't it just like when you think about it now, you go, why didn't I put this stuff in my session plans? <laughs> like for all those years. And Danny Newcomb had a great quote the other day. And he said, um, the players will be as good as the problems you set them. And my view is we often stray away from those kind of kind of problems -y things. So they're having a go at the ref. Okay, this is really interesting. So I ran a session in Bermuda for the tens and I had a lad who, and this has never happened to me. So uh, Yanni played in the world cup. He was in the 2019 rugby world cup. He walked off the pitch halfway through the session because he was so agitated. Now, 15 years ago, I would have probably gone, I'll oh, just ignore him. Or man, what the hell are you doing type stuff? I was like, Cool, let's go and get a drink. Yanni, mate, like, I'm genuinely like so interested in how have we got to this point? Like, tell me what's making you wobble. Like, what's been your solutions? What's been your... I was just fascinating. Like, you got a lad who's been to a World, a World Cup. He's played international rugby. He's, and he's just never thought about any of this stuff. Wasn't even that aware of it. Like, okay, well, let's talk about what's going on in your brain. Yanni, someone cleverer than me has told me that if you smile... <laughs> you go through all that with him again and uh and we and, and it was like it was class like but i guess i've just got to try and be curious about why why am i you know and how can he can get like metacognitive about it how can he almost it reminds me of so i'm scared of hospitals i had um hypnotherapy to be at uh, our first child's birth and fortunately i was late for the second one um and they talk about like, like being in the corner of the room, looking down on yourself, like almost like separating yourself from the situation. And that's what like self-regulation is, isn't it? To be able to go, right, I'm now losing my, I need to take a step back from this. And there's a real good, um, it's a Don't Tell Me The Score podcast and it's called Insomnia. And it talks about like almost giving this thing a name. So, you know, um, I guess it's a bit like Steve Peters and the chimp. It's not part of you, but the chimp's speaking to me now. But actually, it's not me. It's like the chimp. So starting to, that might be a good way to, to create this thing with kids and to create separation might be for everyone to draw a picture or to name it. And then and then when we talk about it, it's not part of that person. It's, it's this thing that's separate from them. But I would really, rec it's a really, it's called insomnia. Um, and don't tell me the score. It's a really good podcast and it's probably got quite a few kind of just triggered me. I'm going to listen to it again. I haven't listened to it in ages. Uh, and because I don't have insomnia, I don't listen to that. I listen to about the first 30 seconds of podcasts. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I would def definitely recommend that. So I have a question. Rusty, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I've got you, Tim. This is the BBC. So... I pride myself in being a coach, developer, and educator. And I, this is going to sound weird, so don't get carried away. I love your brain. Your brain lives in a different place because you so easily can think outside of the box and look at things from many different angles. We probably went through the same type of education. Has this always been part of your innate, is it just rusty, is it innate within you? 
or is it something you've trained your mind to do? And if so, um, how? Yeah, well, I think that's a compliment. Um, what do I think? Um, so look, I did maths at uni. So I actually, when I, whenever people like are going, you're all over the place. I go, I, I did do maths, like, and I'm, I did sciences. And so I would have been quite like, probably a bit thinking like that. Um, what's had impact? Um, so I think some really helpful thinking tools. So some of the stuff I did with Kirk at Google around like, what rules can we break? So let's break a rule and, and see what fresh thinking we get out of this. Now, we might not adopt it. So I'm just doing a piece of work with, uh, with New Zealand Sevens. And I set them, so here's a break the rules. You've got to, um, this is 10X thinking. You've got, to win the, you've got to win the Olympics. You've got to win every game by 50 points. What are the implications for coaching? So they start talking about, well, we need to create this superhero mindset in our players. I'm like, oh, wait, that is there. Now that is interesting. So tell me a bit about it. And, and bizarrely, then the next day, I had a guy who's a psych contact me from New Zealand and he starts talking about, oh, I'm trying to get people to think like, like stuff is limitless. And I was like, I've got the perfect person to connect you with. But just that kind of stimulus of you've, got to do it and win by 50 points you've got to think differently so break some rules that uh, would be would be one another thing would be related worlds so i would go to lots of other sports so i've probably mentioned football hockey cricket rugby business i'm now mentioning business i don't know if i've mentioned any other sports but just getting outside of your bubble is like liberating and you realize oh my days there's there's some other ways of doing this stuff. So we would always, you know, so get Mike Cave in from Fulham, come and watch us coach with England and go, Rusty, like you've just told me you want to create players that can do everything and you've already divided them up into forwards and backs. It makes no sense to me. I'm like, of course, of course it doesn't. Like, why am I doing that? But it's because someone comes from outside of your world. And then I guess the other thing is like two other things. One is feedback. So I would have videoed myself a lot coaching. I hate it. I hate listening to it, but I send it to people and they will send me feedback and it's painful, but it is the only way I'm going to get better. And I send it to really diverse people. So I sent it to James G who I know you've had on as well, Chris. I just said, mate, look, here's some of me coaching. Send me what your thoughts are. Like he doesn't understand anything about rugby but he's definitely going to give me some stuff that's going to, going to help me be better. And the last thing is, like, where do you do your best thinking? And create more time for that. So if it's in the shower, on the toilet, in the car, running, walking, whatever it might be. So I go running, I get to the corner of the downs, it's about 4K away, and then I stop and I write down all the stuff I've been, like, I'll have thought of two things and I'll be going, I'm going to do this tomorrow for the rush soccer thing. Um, and I procrastinate. That's the other thing I do a lot of. So I, um, I would have done the slides for this this morning. I lost all my slides last week. I think I told you, Chris. I lost 250 slides. So I had to actually restart everything again. Um, so I procrastinate under the guise that it creates more connections. Um, and I guess I do um, oh, beautiful the other day. New Zealand Sevens. I said, bring an object. To, that represents why you love England, uh, New Zealand Sevens. And this guy sat on a balcony and he's got a door behind him and I'm trying to work out, is that door attached to the building or? And I said, oh, and, and they've all got objects. They've got like fish hooks and, and shirts and, and, and all this stuff. And, and Tom, the analyst goes, I've got this door rusty. I, uh, I found it in a skip yesterday. And, um, and, and, and New Zealand Sevens has helped me walk through doors. I wasn't confident enough to, and I would feel the same as everyone else. So when I come over to Boston to, to do the soccer conference, and I'm thinking, okay, there's like quite a few people watching now, shit. Like, then I would feel like an imposter all the time. And so like being able to walk through those doors and try new stuff. And as I would talk about that, like, just that karaoke feeling of, Rusty's about to sing karaoke and I'm not that good, but I could probably blag this to be honest like is really important as coaches. So I don't know if that's answered your question, Tim. Um, it's been very helpful, yes. 
you know, I've got loads of people that I check in with and make sense with and speak to and they challenge me and that kind of <clears throat> thing about, yeah, your empty chair. So my empty chair is people like Suzanne Brown. Like, she's really, really helpful for me. Amy Price is my empty chair. She gives me a bit of grief. We had quite a heated argument the other day. We're all made up now, but it's cool. But I would definitely speak to people that challenge me as well. And it might not feel that comfortable at the time, but I know it's for the better. And of course, I'm really lucky. Like, my life is coaching. So the challenge for other people is if you coach 30 hours a year, like lots of rugby coaches will probably do 30, 40 hours a year. Like, you're probably going to just do the stuff that you've always done. You haven't got that time to think. And, and, and that can be really frustrating. So I guess we're trying to help as many of those coaches as possible. And I guess that's where the cards came from, is just to get them to maybe think differently about some stuff. Can I ask a favour? Uh, do you want my brain? <laughs> can I send you a video of a, a webinar interaction with some coaches I'm educating? Yeah, I'm wondering, let's do that. So I I'd get love to see your thoughts on that. Yeah. So Jared Payne, for example, coaches at Ulster. He, he just sends me audio of his meetings and things like that. We just chew the fat on it. So have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? I'm like, a, I guess I'm a naive expert for him. Thank you. Um, but that's a big leap. So 100%, like, oh, my days, like watching yourself coach. Oh, my God. I think, tough, isn't it? I think you mentioned earlier in the webinar, Rusty, your curiosity. You're curious around things. And I think staying curious is a big way to, to open new doors, right, and think differently. Yeah, no, I am. I mean, I, I genuinely would want to be like, I don't think there's many, I think we're scratching the surface, would be my view. Yeah. We're probably scratching the surface of the human mind, if I'm honest, because yeah. some people can do some unbelievable things, and we're not all doing unbelievable things. Uh, but I think we're scratching the surface of coaching. So I kind of sometimes go, so I just did a pod earlier and someone said, ah, oh, probably the same as I'm sure I heard it earlier, like out of the box. And I'm like, maybe the rugby box is just really, really tiny. Like, and quite frankly, I think it is. Like, well, there's so much more we could do. I was watching some Crusaders clips and probably the best club team in the world. And I'm thinking, that could be done so much better. Um, but yes, yeah, staying curious is, is tough because the, I guess the, and I'm not, I'm not saying, but for all of you guys, like the, the kind of, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Like being really good at something because you also then get trapped in, well, I'm really good at this and this is how we do it. And you might not be as curious as you would have been. So I think like the, the kind of double-edged sword of expertise is you've still got to remain curious. You've still got to go, what was my second choice? So when I chose to do this game, what was my second choice? What was my third choice? If nothing else, if you have one more option, and the way Kirk speaks about it at Google is like convergent thinking, obviously, like what are the options? Divergent thinking. And my sense is, we would probably benefit from spending more time thinking convergently. What is possible? What could we do? Okay. Then we're more likely to make a better decision in the end. Okay. We've got all these options, which is the best one at this time. What was our second choice? So classy example of this hockey are just doing this. Um, we're just doing a piece of work around the talent pathway, which I hate those words, but it's being done by the EIS. So don't share this clip too widely. And one of the guys said, um, oh, so we're, you know, they bring in the word scouting. Now, scouting for me is from football. So um, I said, OK, that's cool. What was what was the second choice word? What do you mean? Well, when we chose scouting, like, what was the reasons for it? What was second, third and fourth choice? Oh, well, we didn't think of any more. So people are just in the red straight away. Scouting, we've already got that word. Well, we, we could have called it insight. Like, we could have picked something different that actually talked about what it is. I just don't like scouting because it has some, some pretty negative connotations over here in, in football. So, um, but, but simple stuff like that, like, why do we call sessions? Why don't we have sessions? Like, why aren't sessions titled with questions? 
like how can we uh how can we wrestle back momentum that's the title of today's session you know what i mean so but we we wouldn't have that why do we have to have apologies but, but chris but at the start when you said oh well, here's some here's some kind of objectives yeah. well everyone is going to have a different experience and someone will have some different stuff. And if we were to go back to your objectives, someone might go, Oh, I didn't have that one actually. Yeah. But you know, there's lots of, you know, having been a teacher for two years, like so many traditions that I'm thinking, I, I just talked about this in the podcast earlier, like I didn't know how to mark stuff. So, so I didn't give a mark, but I give feedback and the kids were like, well, what's the mark? I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, I don't know, but I can't like say that just yet. Oh, well, no, I think the thing, you know, well, the reality is like the marks, like if you got a nine out of 10, you're not looking at it. If you got a one, you have your head's gone and you're wobbling and you're not looking at it. So, but if you've got to read some feedback, then you're probably more likely to do it. And then, so why am I leading all the lessons? Like, so I'm like, and the kids don't lead the lessons. No, well, why not? Like, they could all get jobs as teachers at the end if we taught them to lead lessons. We would all be better players if we knew back then what we know as coaches. So I'm assuming they'll we'll have better outcomes in the classroom. Well, of course we did. So I was a terrible teacher, but our kids got 40%. 40% of the kids got 100 UMS. That's like the highest you can get. Mine, compared to the head of economics, my kids were two grades on average higher. Like... But it was only because, like, I really involved them and they were, it was like metacognitive for them. I didn't have any revision resources. So kids will split you into groups, will create revision resources. Whoever creates the most impactful one will get a cream egg. You know, like, they should be the ones doing the work, not me. So I just think we're, we, we're, we've we got so many traditions Rusty, can I ask you a question? Just what you just said. And when Tim was talking, he made me think of it when you talked about superhero mindset. And then I think you just led into it or maybe gave the end result of what you'd hope for. But specifically with younger kids and even more specifically, probably with females, what tools do you use to get, you know, just on the vein of what you've been talking about to get them to be more intrinsically motivated? Because in our environment, I mean, everything, like you said, is driven by parents. So how do you get these younger players? I mean, I don't think it's an issue once you hit a certain level, or maybe it's always an issue, but to be more intrinsically motivated. I mean, if the end result is they all had hundreds more than any other class, how did you get yeah, them? Yeah, by the way, so, so I'm not saying that was an easy process for me or them. Like, that was really sticky. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was only when they got the exam results. I remember I was, I was running in Spain and I had a phone call and it was the night before the results came out and the head of economics was like, you're not going to believe this. I was like, I actually don't believe it, quite frankly. Um, yeah, look, I, I don't think that's my job to get them motivated. I think it's definitely my job to understand what they are motivated by. I think it's then my job to, the way I think of like pathways is like their experiences and expertise. So it's to create really meaningful, <laughs> useful, challenging experiences that, meaningful being really important and then to provide the expertise now the expertise might be scaffolding them to be able to run it themselves you know my sense you know one of the biggest motivators is you know if you look at self-determination theory like well are we making them more competent are we actually are they seeing progress but also like autonomy so where does that sit in lots of our worlds i'm i'm thinking so we did a thing at birmingham where I just kept it on the whiteboard. I put um, uh, uh, missed, a, missed an opportunity for the players to have autonomy, took an opportunity. And I just kept a record for the coaches during the session. Like, why did you do that? Could they have done that? Yeah, 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 okay. I mean, what do you think it's saying when you don't let them do that? Like, and what's the benefit of letting them do that? And by the way, this might be messy for a few weeks, but... Uh, Ultimately, if we can have this, well, then, then we can coach, quite frankly, because one of the things that I, that I also think is like often I'm doing stuff that's preventing me from coaching. So I'm setting out the cones, I'm keeping score, I'm refereeing. I'm, whereas actually, if we played a game, let's say in rugby, where if, 
the attack didn't have a player over the ball quickly enough and two defenders called turnover, then A, I'm coaching scanning. They're looking for the right cues. And B, they can run it. Well, that means I don't have to look at this area, which is a small part of the game. Actually, I can look at wider stuff that'll help me coach more. <clears throat> so I'm also always thinking, and the football example I give is, um, same at Birmingham, one of the coaches, like, he said, um, I said, oh, because I was like, look, why don't we both look at the players off the ball and see who are the top three scanners? And then we'll, and then it'd be really interesting to, to chat to them about why, why that is. And he's feeding the ball. And after 30 seconds, he's like, Rusty, I can't look at the man feed the ball. I'm like, why the fuck are you feeding the ball? Excuse my French. Like, Put some balls around the pitch, put numbers on them so they're worth different goals, so they can be really tactical. So we've got a three-point ball, a two-point ball, a five-point ball, and we've got the, what's it called in uh, in Harry Potter? It's like the, the glitch or something. Or, golden snitch, it, yeah. Golden snitch. You know, the golden snitch is worth 20 points and you might save it for the end. Um, and then we can watch them and see who's the best scanners. But quite frankly, at the moment, you feeding the balls is not helpful for you or them. Um, and, but once again, it's tradition, isn't it? So, you know, hockey, the coaches stand in refereeing positions. Rugby, we all look at the ball and we stand together and we, we stand behind the defence when the most important thing is, like, where are the defenders looking? And yet none of us know where any of the defenders are looking because we're still we're behind, behind the end. Yeah. So there's so much, like... Um, I don't know if you've answered the question. I've probably gone on a on a few tangents along the way. Well, Steve, what did you get from that? Because we talked about objectives, and like we said, everybody's going to have different objectives. Um, so, what did you take from Rusty's answer? Let me check you out, Chris. <laughs> oh, Chris, I'm waiting for the bus to run over my house. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I thought it was great. I mean, there's a whole bunch. There's more notes, and I think I'd be able to, but. Uh, you know, one of the first things, obviously, was just the autonomy, making them autonomous. Um, you know, there's still a question. I think, you know, when you talk about being with the sevens, um, you know, I just keep going back to, like, that. Age, just take that age girl who is still looking at dad for, for all her positive feedback is, and I would still have a question is, how do you make that seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old female and I think it's something we miss, you know, with all the amazing stuff we have in coaching and education. I think it's something that we never touch on is how to make them more intrinsically motivated. And well, I think it, we lose a lot of great athletes yeah, because look, we don't focus on that. And it, and it might be, a, you know, so something I think a lot about is like belonging. So Owen Eastwood, I would look at some of Owen's stuff. His Finding Mastery podcast is pretty special. He's got a book out called Belonging. Um, you would all be able to think of environments where you were, you belonged and you were probably at your best and environments where you didn't. So all of this stuff like, well, actually, if we get our two best players and people know they're our best players and they go and spend time supporting the others. So that's exactly what happened when I did the session in Boston. Eight-year-old kid picks the, says, can I be a co-coach, Rusty? Well, he's already like disrupted my thinking because I'm like, I didn't even offer it to the kids. And one of the kids has picked a card. I'm like, okay, on one condition. Like, you don't tell anyone else. It's your secret mission. <laughs> and then he has impact. So, same. You tell two girls, look, which players do you think you could help today? And what type of stuff? So, it might be, I'm going to help Rachel score a goal. Well, now that's a different if you tell everyone. Rachel, you're not very good. I've told these two girls to help you score a goal. Whereas actually if the best kids, and this kid was the best kid, so he was the best player there. He had self-selected because only the best players wanting to be the coach. And then he's then catching people do stuff well and then stretching them. And then genuinely 20 minutes in and, and, uh, and, and Tim was there. I was like, come on, tell me your best coaching interactions. And they're all pointing at this pesky little kid. And I'm going, no, 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 no. Don't think you understand. He's not a coach. I'm a coach. And they go, no, no, no. When he high-fived me and bumped me and I'm all in and I'm thinking, of course you are. So belonging and how you create that 
will be critical for me. Brilliant. Debbie's had her hand up for a while. So Debbie, if we can make your question quick and then we'll come to you, Eric, and then we'll let Rusty get on with yeah, his day. I'm just going to text someone. I'm going to be a bit late for a, for a 5.30, but I'm cool. It's chilled. Debbie, do you want to go? You're unmuted. All right. Hey, Rusty. Nice hey, Debbie. And um, I just have a few comments about what you said. I coach a UA girls team. I've coached for 25 years at different levels. And um, I've been a PE teacher for 31 years, and which is which has really helped me in my coaching career because I I, I understand kids. Um, my thing is, I have coached these little girls, and they keep coming back to me. But I do a lot of interactions with the girls as far as you know, letting them state their opinions. They all come from different backgrounds, different experiences. But uh, I also communicate with the parents after every practice. Um, yeah. Tell them that their child did this well. I always start off with positive. But I have, I have gone to practices with a goal in mind and on the, you know, spare of the moment, I've had to change it because I can tell the kids aren't engaged in the practice. And I will either sit down and talk to them or we'll play, you know, tag games, which they love, or what game do y'all want to play? So I think that's very important. So what is your what is your thoughts on developing at the grassroots, the very young age, um, for any sport, not just soccer or rugby or anything? but for any sport. Um, I'm probably like, think the same as you, like, are they going to come back next time? It's the most important thing. Are they going to fall in love with the sport? You just triggered me on a couple of things. So one thing is like, think about the three parents that you probably want to speak to the least and maybe speak to them the most. And then the other thing is, can you direct parents' attention towards certain things? So parents, I want you to notice some stuff, some kids other than your own do well, and I'm going to get you to feedback at the end, as opposed to they're just looking at the mistakes and thinking it doesn't look like the game. But but from my point of view, so Deb, in my in my mind would always be cards. So creativity, awareness, resilience, decision making, self organizing. So that would essentially be my kind of beyond the are they going to come back? Are they going to fall in love with the game? These are the skills I want to develop. So creativity, I'm thinking, can every kid use both feet? <clears throat> in football, both hands, both feet in rugby. Awareness, am I coaching, scanning? Am I using freeze? Am I resilience, uh, individual, contextual? How am I going to find out about wobbles and how I can help them? Am I coaching decision-making and am I coaching self-organizing? Um, am I giving them opportunities to organize themselves now? I'm also with you, like, you've got to adapt sessions. You can throw it out of the book and you might just play Bulldog for the whole session if that's the right thing to do. Right. It's amazing to me, like, a couple of coaches said to me, do you know what? I don't even know what games our kids like. And I'm like, what? Like, in England, if you ask kids in rugby, like, what's your favourite games? They'll all say two. Bulldogs, kick tennis. Bankers. And... uh why wouldn't you play that? Why wouldn't you start with that and then evolve it into another game, for example? So, so I don't know if I've answered your question. My view is, how do we get them back? I'm definitely thinking cards, and I'm 100% thinking of individual. Every kid is an individual. And then I'm probably a bit like you, like, I've got to recognise the importance of parents here. Like, I'm over-communicating with them. I'm making sure they know what's going on. And I'm definitely directing their attention towards the stuff that I know is important, but they haven't got a clue. So they're looking at the scoreboard. I'm thinking irrelevant. Like there was a, there was a clip put on a, I'm, I'm on an England touch website. There's a clip put on of this little kid and he's like a hot stepper and everyone's going, Oh, he's amazing. I'm like, doesn't look like much fun for his teammates. Does it? Like he hasn't passed the ball once. They're all stood watching. They're not developed, you know, so, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking like, so I'm looking at that kid thinking, well, actually, he's going to need to be able to pass. And actually, he's probably hasn't got the right level of challenge at the moment. So what's the kind of individual considerations for him? So, and then I guess around all of that, and what I spoke about then is, I want people to feel like they belong. I want, exactly. them, I want people to feel like they belong to this team, that they are part of it, that they are valued. And when you said they're like, I asked them their opinions, I'm going to spend time listening. Like, I don't have time not to listen. Now, I've coached in some environments where I, in my head, I'm going, is there any danger of us stopping talking about this and actually doing something? But I know that the right thing is for us to talk about it and understand and listen to each other. And that is like, that's making me wobble inside. But on the outside, I'm like, looking like I'm quite chilled. So that would... That would be really important to me. And I think the stuff that Crusaders are doing around like theming and storytelling is, is a real powerful way to engage with kids. So, um, I've, you know, people will have done it a bit in lockdown with uh, the hockey coach who like themed some of their, their stuff around Mario, Super Mario and the different levels. Uh, the Crusaders are themed around um, recently they did like the rumble in the jungle and, 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 and kind of that as a theme, but how we theme and storytell is really important for kids. Brilliant. All right. Eric. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Hey Rusty. Uh, I had a, a comment uh, leading to a, a question for you. So, you know, uh, necessity's the the mother of invention, right? So maybe it's good you you lost your slides because I enjoyed the visual uh, thinking that you you had on there. Uh, for me, it was kind of one of these synthesis moments where it dovetailed with some other work I'm doing on business model generation, which is like design thinking, human centered design, using visual thinking tools. And there's uh, this great uh, when we were talking about Google earlier. There's this great book that called Business Model Generation that has lots of stuff about uh, Google in it and other disruptive uh, uh, business model uh, generation. And so I think there's that link between player centered and human centered design, like they're the same thing instead of, you know, the developer who puts uh, features and uh, new hardware behind their thinking. It's the Nintendo Wii's that outdo uh, Xbox or PlayStation because they came up with something really simple that people want to do, like play a game together with a, a movement and not have, you know, not be the hardcore gamer. So that's what like player centered design is. It's putting the, the player there. And so my leading to my question there is, you know, is it possible or, or which one is better in your opinion? To be player centered, if you come as the coach with a predetermined topic and you say, I'm coaching this today versus you come and say, all right, you have your journal, write down two things you want to work on today based on the game. Which one of those approaches to session design is more player centered? Um, do I have to pick one? <laughs> <laughs> or just talk around them, you know, just yeah, like. No, look, um, yeah, I mean, I would, I, I, and, um, and, and, and it would be helpful, wouldn't it, if the kids had a journal? So it's something we've debated lots and there's some cool journals out there. Um, and then sometimes, you know, it, I guess it depends. Like if you've got a match at the weekend, you'll often go, look, we need, uh, we need to tick some boxes here. Um, when and why? So that's the stuff I think about. So I know you had Amy on and I've become slightly obsessed with her video game design stuff. But, but what it does do is often we do sessions in, you know, we're going to do high pressing. Well, like... We're not always going to high press. So we need to understand when and why. So designing sessions that, I guess, give players, that, you know, the players have to make decisions around what tactic or what individual skill to use and why. And I guess that's also a little bit around, like, when do you share a session so that people can actually have time to think and go, okay, so in this session, you know, the, the, the couple of things that would be helpful for me would be this. Um, that's what I guess what I'm what I'm thinking about when you ask that. Um, yeah, I mean I wouldn't deviate too far from the game. So Danny Newcomb talks about how much of the game do you rub out, um, but I'm definitely thinking about pitch size, numbers, rules, underloads, overloads, scoring systems, you know, and, and then 
really with outcomes in mind. So we might play a game and it's first team to score 25 points. But actually there's different ways of scoring points and they can make choices around look. But then also I do I would do some stuff that would be like, so I did a session at Academy where I said, oh, what have you been working on? They said goal scoring. So one of the teams, so I would very rarely have two teams with the same scoring system because that's not the reality of the game. The game is this team rocked up with a plan and this team rocked up with a plan and they're not the same. And you've got to work out what the other person's is. So in the same way I spoke about secret missions, 10 years of my career, probably told everyone the same thing. Now I would very rarely have a huddle where I would tell everyone the same thing. I might tell two people or four people or one team uh, what this is. But so their theme is goal scoring. So I'm like, okay, can, well, can we almost test it today? So one team is one point for a goal. Every time you get in the opposition half and you don't score, you go into minus two. They're on minus 12 within four minutes and, and they are wobbling. So I'm like, I know a guy much cleverer than me. He says, if you smile, <laughs> like four minutes in and we've got to this. But, but it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I've done loads of sessions on goal scoring. Like, oh, we've done six weeks on it. But like, well, oh, let's make it feel a bit different, shall we? So there's also a bit of like, how does it look like the game? But also, how does it feel like the game? And for the teenage lads on minus points, fucking hell. And did the same with cricket. So I did it with England under 19 cricket. Like, uh, there's a lad who's, who's not that good at hitting boundaries. And well, he, he can, he just chooses not to. So same, like, every shot that you didn't hit a boundary on was minus one, four and a six. He was on minus 15. Um, pretty quickly and his head was gone I know someone way cleverer than me he says smile um, so uh, so I might have a theme but I would probably embed it into a game and I would be thinking about they've got to have other ways of, of achieving this and um, and probably both teams don't have the same score scoring system and they've got to start working some stuff out the classic I do in most environments is I'll go in and go, look, I might say to Stephen's team, look, um, you know, you've got eight on your team. Uh, three of you are going to walk in defence. Uh, your goal is not to be seen by the opposition or to be seen by any of the coaches watching. No one ever sees them. <laughs> Maybe a couple have. They, they don't tell anyone else. They don't go, he's walking, like, let's exploit him. Like, like, so I usually start with that and go, how often do you have games where it's different scoring systems for each team or they both got different people go, yeah, but never. Cool. How often does the game look like that? Every week. Interesting. Like, we're not setting problems that are going to help people with the game. We need to scan for weak defenders. We need to exploit weak defenders. Um... Once again, don't know if I've answered your question in any way, shape or form, but um, I, I clearly love the idea that players come to training with some plan of what they want to get better at. And they lead those interactions with coaches. I'm also aware that that doesn't happen naturally. We might need to scaffold and model conversations and practice it. So I also did a session, a hockey session, and came and watched some coaches and they went, OK, kids, go and... Um, is fit under, under 15s. Go and, uh, go and share something with someone else that they've done well. So I walk over to two teenage lads and they stood looking at each other like this. I was like, oh, lads, are you, uh, how many times have you done this before? And, then, and one of the lads, fair play, he said, uh, Rusty, I only think we're doing this because you're here. I saw that, hey, that's good awareness. So, you know, it, it, it's simple. Like coaches could just go, look, look, and, and me and Eric will just model that conversation. So, Eric, I love the way you've done this. been really, like, helpful for our team, um, you know, and, and Rusty, this. So, so I'm also mindful that we, we might need to scaffold some stuff here as well around problem solving because go back to what we chatted about earlier, often that's not their lives. They're not problem solving. Yeah. They're like being told what to do. Stop asking questions. Just get on with it. Type, you know, sit in this seat. There's a seating plan. There's the, you know. So, so often sport can be, I mean, I think sport's the, 
if you know my card stuff i think sport does it better than anything else mate i mean just ask the just ask the history teacher exactly just ask the history teacher like how are you doing you know all the stuff on the school website so how are you doing grit in the history lessons how are you doing creativity in the history and 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 get excited for the blank look um so I would find myself scaffolding a lot of people around this stuff. Brilliant, Rusty. We've been uh, we've been on for almost two hours. I know, and, mate. and I said forty five minutes. And I know you've got a five thirty, right? So, coaches who are on, I, I ask I ask this for you. Um, think about how you came in feeling. Think about how you're leaving feeling, and think about at your best, your pledge to what you'll do and what you'll implement from this. So, Rusty, been brilliant. Thank you so much. Any final words, Rusty? Is it? Yeah, no, I just appreciate you hanging. If anyone wants to get in touch, uh, Chris has got my deets. Yeah. Feel free just to, to I'll share. Send I will share. Yeah. And um, then Tim, Tim apologizes. He had to get off early and, and yeah, run the webinar was... himself. So he, he wanted to make sure I let you know. And, and he was very thankful and grateful. No, so. it's cool. No, I really appreciate it i know that uh, everyone's pretty zoomed out at this uh, moment in their lives yeah. apart from people in new zealand so i've been doing a bit of work in new zealand and they're like oh we haven't i was like like why can't you work this out and they're like oh rusty we haven't used zoom for like five or six months yeah i'm like how is that possible possible uh, anyway look yeah no look thanks so much for jumping on really appreciate it and if there's any stuff that you want or you're interested in or then i'm sure just just Chris, just connect me up. Yeah, I will. And uh, everyone, thanks for getting on. I've just got on the screen who we've got next mm -hmm. and what our core value is. Obviously, more to come, but the coaching cards are absolutely brilliant. Um, and Rusty, oh. I might have to get back to you with the with the uh, player bingo and how that looks and yeah, and stuff well, I've like done that. a bit of bingo stuff around like often around team tactic-y type stuff. But I like the idea of a you know as an individual, almost as coaches, did we. Did we provide some individual feedback? Did we, you know, was there a bit of stretch? Was there a bit of, you know, and maybe the players just like populate, a, you yeah, know, their own bingo card Four, yeah, four areas and go, look, here's, here's four things that I need from you as a coach today. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Mate, you've, you've patented it. Well done you. Yeah. Yeah. But listen, you, you taught me to be curious. So anyway, brilliant. Thanks everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for everybody. Thanks, You'll everyone. watch this later. Thanks, thanks.